Thank you, Steve. I think this um, emphasis on the responsibility, not just of companies and organizations, but uh, individuals, is an increasingly important one in this open and network world that we live in. So to continue this discussion on the societal and the political impacts of AI, I'd like to welcome to the stage to moderate the next discussion the leader of an organization that is doing some very interesting and innovative work to help cities and other public organizations develop and share software and policy that is open, legible, and useful. Please welcome to the stage the president of the Foundation for Public Code, Ben Cerveni. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to uh, in turn introduce my co-panelists. Uh, Stephen Hsu uh, is the Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation, Professor of Theor Theoretical Physics at Michigan State University. His primary work has been in applications of quantum field theory, dark energy, black holes, entropy bounds, and particle physics. He's also made contributions in genomics and bioinformatics, and in encryption and information security. Najira Sambuli currently leads policy and advocacy to, uh, policy advocacy to promote digital equity across in access to and use of the web at the World Wide Web Foundation. She previously worked at iHub in Nairobi, where she provided strategic guidance for growth of technology innovation research in the East African region. Thanks for joining me. So I wanted to start off with just a little framing commentary, drawing on some of the evocative remarks of the Prime Minister at the, uh, at the opening session. Um, I, I would want to frame sort of maybe a little bit of what we're talking about here as a moment of transition between uh, what we consider technology and what we consider infrastructure. Humans invent things all the time, um, and for the first 30 or 40, 30 years perhaps of this uh, period of time, they're called technology. And then uh, there's a transitionary moment where this technology is deployed widely in society and it, it becomes infrastructural. And I think this is, at the moment, we're moving through this phase right now with network services technology, Estonia being a leading actor in this sort of understanding of how this transition takes place. Um, whereas with AI, it's still firmly rooted in this sort of phase of the technological. But um, as the Prime Minister noted, these sort of uh, cycles of innovation are becoming highly compressed. And so we're, you know, even as we're sort of metabolizing uh, the network services that we're turning into infrastructure, we're sort of already having to start thinking about this next oncoming wave of innovation. So there's perhaps a way in which we treat, you know, sort of the beginning of this cycle as a disruptive market-based activity and then sort of an integrative period where this is actually moved into sort of a regulated circumstance in the larger society, possibly with uh, government actors involved. Um, and so I kind of, you know, there, there are a number of different aspects I feel like this, this kind of uh, cycle, um, you know, sort of puts into play. And I think one of the really huge issues that we have uh, that we're also learning specifically already in the network services domain, and I think we're going to come across quite quickly in the AI domain as well, is this is issue of sort of the multiple voices that need to be represented in this space. Because, you know, what we've seen, especially kind of in the earliest days of the sort of network technology innovation, a lot of the disruptive technologies were based around services that people designed for themselves. You know, you would, as an entrepreneur, you would say, what problems do I need solved? And then you would build a service that solved that problem. And so a lot of the sort of the initial you know, deployment of web services happened around kind of a, a very specific demographic of people that had, had access to those technologies. So um, now we're sort of seeing in this in this integrative period, you know, there's, a, there's a, a concern to try and bring those services, you know, to a wider group of people in a more inclusive kind of society. And so, you know, how do we frame this conversation? Uh, Najira, I was, wanted to ask you about how, how we could frame this in a way, you know, because of uh, the work with inclusion and advocacy, how do we look at this in a broader perspective, uh, the, the onset of the AI services that we're experiencing with now? Sure, and maybe for the next uh, 26 or so minutes, we can try and not make it so much about the technology and think about the people, um, just largely because I think those anxieties have not been understood, and if we try to uh, situate these real impacts, social and political impacts, through the lens of technology, we tend to think of them as technical fixes, right, or infrastructural fixes, but these anxieties are, are compounding in interesting ways. Um, 
Right now, I think the mood across the world is of anxiety about people's space, belonging, autonomy, agency, all these values that we keep talking about on paper, how do they exist in practice? Uh, uh, this compounded to the spectrum of history where there are people who have already been left behind. So that when we have something like the global goals on leave no one behind, it really becomes about how we are thinking about it in terms of that spectrum of history, present and future. And so it is within that that I think reversing the understanding of this issue and looking at it outside of the spectrum of technology and not uh, thinking just AI or blockchain or whatever else is in vogue at a particular moment in time, is that um, the work that needs to go into understanding what I guess are incalculables and intangibles and not the stuff that you're about to line it into a, a line of code or a risk factor if you're doing the mathematical calculations, is that the, that would probably force us all to slow down a little bit, listen to communities more, understand the grievances, understand hopes, aspirations, frustrations. And the question seems to be whose job is it to do that? Right? Um, governments are busy saying, okay, maybe, you know, we're trying to make sense of what's happening with all these revolutions or fourth industrial revolution as we're calling it broadly. Um, private sector is like, okay, somebody figure out what the people want and communicate to us. The people are like, listen to us. And there's a, there's a disconnect there in terms of how the world is ordered presently to figure out um, how to situate the technical, uh, sorry, the technical within the social and political without making it seem like we can reorder the world to think that we can fit it nicely through the frames of the technologies we're building today. To say nothing, of course, of who's building the technology, who's assuming that the technology they're building is supposed to be applicable to the rest of the world and all that jazz. So if we could spend the next couple of minutes thinking about the people um, and the people in the various manifestations there are, then maybe that humbles us all, especially those of us in the technological world, to think about all these values and how they actually come to be manifested in practice when it comes to the real people out there that we're saying we're working for. Definitely, and I, I feel like one of the real issues around this uh, kind of um, leveling of the playing field is something that was touched on with the first panel as well, is sort of picking up where they left off in a way, is this idea of explainability. Um, and I feel that, you know, it's interesting, I think, Stephen, your work has spanned, you know, a variety of disciplines, you know, that all deal with the unfolding sort of nature of complex systems. And I wonder if you have any insight, you know, what insights you can share with us about how one might make more explainable these types of, you know, uh, this black box, how does the glass box appear, you know, how do we get there? I have bad news when it comes to explainability. Uh, let me mention, for example, that 20 to 30 percent of our GDP now derives from technologies that start in quantum physics. And yet, how many people in this room have any understanding of quantum physics? So explainability is illusory. When you use a drug developed by a pharmaceutical company, that pharmaceutical company is testing many molecules, and they don't actually have any real understanding of why the molecule works. They have to go to empirical drug trials and then decide what works. Today, if we were to invent aspirin, it would have to go through an extremely complex trial process because nobody really actually knows how aspirin is working in your body. Mm. So explainability is a myth. We become used to technologies and get used to relying on them. Mm. Um, I want to say a little bit about social and political impacts of AI, and in particular, AI applied to genomics, which is a field that I work in, uh, at least in recent years. Um, now, everyone can remember a few years ago that there was no such thing as face recognition, right? Suddenly, it got into your phone, and now when I board the airplane in, in uh, the United States, uh, Delta uses my face to allow me to board the plane. All of that happened just in a few years. I want to tell you about a revolution that's happening in genomics that has just started. Nobody here is aware of it, uh, but uh, similar to the case of, fa of face recognition, as we pass through a certain level of data, when we pass a certain threshold where we have enough data and we have the good algorithms to analyze that data, suddenly we can do things which nobody could have believed just a few years ago, just as with face recognition. So for the first time, we can, by looking just at the DNA of an individual, we can predict aspects of that individual. For example, we can predict their height, plus or minus a couple of centimeters, just from the DNA. I can go to a crime scene, and if I get DNA from the gun, I can say the person who shot this gun was 180 centimeters, plus or minus two or three centimeters. That's a reality today. We can predict uh, the people that are in the top one or two percent risk for most common diseases now, heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, prostate cancer for men, 
All of these things now, we can detect the outliers, not just the people that are at 10 times normal probability of having the disease, but also 10 times less probability of having the disease than the typical population. All of those scientific developments happened just in the last 12 to 24 months. Perhaps the most revolutionary one is that we can now crudely predict the cognitive ability of individuals from genotype alone. Scientists looking at longitudinal social science data can look, for example, at brothers born in the same family, attended the same schools, but if one of them has better genetic intelligence capability, which we can detect directly from the DNA, and one has less capability, we can predict that one will be economically more successful 30 or 40 years later in their life. And we're doing that by looking at data, looking back at data for people who are already 60, 70 years old. So this is a revolution that is going to reshape society significantly. Um, and already today, embryos are being screened for people who are going through in vitro fertilization. Uh, embryos are being screened for those qualities that I just described. Currently in Denmark, almost 10% of babies born are born through in vitro fertilization. In most developed countries, the number is something like three to 5%. So we're talking about a non-trivial fraction of the human population, which will be affected by AI technologies applied to large genomic data sets. And so I, I just want to give that as an example of something that's going to hit us yeah. relatively soon. Well, and, and and potentially unexplainably so. This is the part of the problem is that they're sort of washing over us and we have very little to grab onto in terms of how this is going to affect us. So I guess then, you know, sort of going back a little bit to the model that I was describing at the, at the beginning about this sort of cycle of innovation, if we have sort of the disruption phase and then an integration phase, you know, where the, in which that integration involves potentially, you know, regulatory or standards-based activities like we were just heard from the previous speaker, like how do we even approach that from the, the you know, how do we get there uh, integratively? And maybe yeah. we can go. No, yeah. I was, I was trying to figure out if I agree with Stephen about explainability, because I think it comes down to what we mean by that. Explaining what that means for humanity is, is very different from how the functions, the bits and bobs come together. And listening to that is, I think, a classic uh, element of the age of disruption we're in, where we're seeing what is possible in more, let's call it lab or startup or prototyping ses uh, sessions. But what that actually means for people, so let me use maybe not too theoretical an example, but one is a problematic one in history, where there have been certain people who were used for particular kinds of testing. So I think of the, you know, the people of Namibia and what happened to them. When they hear about this and something that is being cooked up in the lab, or anyone else who has read that part of history, you'll, you have to consider that anxiety that will come up about what does that mean about those who might be considered in any society to be undesirable. Is there, are they the people who are going to be subjects in the lab for whom we eliminate that particular DNA trait, for example? Or if we think about the data that is being studied right now to create this predictive on the DNAs, you're like, who has been included and who hasn't? And what does that mean for me as an individual or me as a member of a particular community in this global order and where we will fit in that? That's where it becomes very real and that's where we don't have very tidy um, understandings of how we do that, but we do need to situate those conversations. We do need, what I'd say, conferences on disagreements and anxieties to figure out what this really means in the world as and when it becomes mainstream. And therefore, it, it may not be about explaining the, everything technical, but explaining or conversing with societies about what this will mean for them, for us to core, uh, sort of like, co-investigate how we can make sure there are rules of engagement uh, so that it's not one particular set of actors, it's not the three of us determining everyone's d the future of everyone's DNA and what that means in the global order. So that's where the real stuff comes in. It's the most difficult, perhaps, work to do, but it is a very necessary component as much as we want to talk about which part, or which strand of AI, the autonomous or the intelligence, or both, that we should be following. And until we figure out how we're going to make uh, sense of that very untidy part of the world, we're going to keep building things that are just going to create more distrust in society, and eventually we might live through an age of backlash against technology, which is going to be counterproductive to everybody. So I think that's where we have to figure out the explainability aspects. I mean, certainly if we're going to have to approach the regulation or standardization of these domains, you know, there has to be obviously a way to communicate what's happening in them in order for the policymakers to even, you know, come to terms with that in some way. So that I guess that's kind of more what I'm maybe not explainability of the of on the you know sort of. Uh, 
actual you know, modeling of the of the theoretical physics of the situation, but sort of what does that how, what does this mean in terms of the effect of society, and how do you how do you model that? You know, because you sort of have an operational model for where this is going to go and how it can be you know productized or implemented, and that in turn forms a relationship with what society's sort of processes of normalization and how they how those things can serve the society best, and who gets to decide what that service looks like. I, I agree with both of these sets of comments. Um, the deep explainability for many of these new technologies is not going to be available. So for example, I accept that AlphaGo can beat any human in Go. I have no idea actually How if I open that. up the deep neural net yeah. what AlphaGo is doing to make its decision. So explainability I mean, I, at the deep level is not there. Explainability at the level of societal impacts and how society should make decisions about these new technologies is crucial because I believe that that is the only way forward. When we're confronted with technologies like gene editing or embryo screening or even face recognition, society, individuals in society need to at least reach some level of understanding of what is going on and what the future implications are. And then policymakers have to aggregate the feelings of their populations to develop policies for the future. So in, in a sense though, there, there, there must be some sort of medium by which we can communicate this type of, you know, uh, model. And I'm, I'm kind of, this is what I'm looking for in terms of, is this a narrative experience that we need to tell stories about what the future is going to look like in a speculative design sense? Do we have, you know, visualization capabilities that are going to allow us to show in some way the complexity of these systems? Because that's really, I think, what we're dealing with here, whether it is an AI model. I mean, I think that's one of the interesting points you just touched on, is that for the design of some of these systems, even the actual architects of the system, once it's underway, cannot actually yeah. You know, understand its activity, and I think that is that in and of itself is something that is you know needs to be explained. <laughs> right. So, um, well, I, I think that um, yeah. So, in the example of AlphaGo, you, you touched on a point there, which is that I might understand the machine learning algorithms that were used to train AlphaGo, but once it's a trained neural network, if I were to open it up, I can make no sense of the millions or perhaps billions of connection strengths that were tuned through that optimization. So at some point, we're dealing with technologies that humans themselves cannot understand, even the builders of those systems. So how is that governable? That is the real question. It's, it's, a, difficult, it's a difficult question. Um, but again, I, I, I revert to the idea that all of us would bet that AlphaGo will defeat some random person mm -hmm. chosen in this room. So the functional capabilities of the object, we can all accept that are, they're somewhat predictable, even if the deep understanding of it is absent. Mm -hmm. No, I was thinking about narratives and uh, something I was reading recently that said, I think for how most people across the world have come to understand the age we're living through is a lot through uh, speculative fiction and movies, right? So we seem to be living in an age where we're inventing for what was in the movies. And the question becomes, how do we start explaining what could come and balance the narrative. So right now, we're also contending with people trying to sell AI as the best thing since sliced bread for humanity and trying to suppress the fact that there are very you know, serious consequences and impacts already being experienced. Let me even situate this further into something that has happened already, not even just what's in Steven's lab, around um, AI and politics in terms of um, the elections that we've all gone through. Um, before Cam you know, Cambridge Analytica happened in the UK and the US as we understand it today, that model had been tested in other parts of the world and nobody was willing to listen to the fact that there are other people who were being, you know, test beds. Mm -hmm. The big challenge here with AI on social and political impacts is our, but our data or data as a fuel means our bodies by ext extension, our existences in particular parts of the world or as communities means we're actually just sites of experimentation or of extraction and you know, that cycle is not necessarily self-fulfilling to advance people. And those anxieties are what we are gonna have to really humble ourselves back down to understand. Um, and especially where we're talking about global and how we're going to create a, a global governance framework or international. Does it start with, if it has not happened in Europe, it has not happened anywhere? Or do we start to understand that we need to open and expand our thinking about how we are all interconnected? So when we talk about values of inclusiveness, um, all these nice sounding values we say we all adhere to as humanity, what they have meant for people in terms of experiments that have not been seen through the global lens as we understand it today, and make sure that as we're building what's in Steven's lab and other labs here represented, we have an understanding of the very real world they're going to be for, uh, brought out into, and future proof for that, not so that the role of governments or regulation or everything else we're calling for now is not to retrofit against something that has gone bad, but we can also have regulation 
it coexist in a world where we are actually thinking about these different scenarios? And finally, it can stop being the bad sounding word that everybody seems to think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think regulation, it's interesting because I think if you sort of reverse the idea of regulation, a lot of what, like for instance, game design is a practice which is about like a sculpture and possibility space, essentially. It's a constraint-based generative design system where you say, you know, here is a, here is a scaffolding in which all sorts of activity can take place, which actually is, is a proactive, you know, sort of participatory process rather than one that's, you know, viewed as like a, something that's tamping down the options. Um, but, the other, the other point I sort of wanted to make was, you know, where, where are we going to start to see the moment where, um, you know, right now we sort of, one of the things, I work a lot with cities, and I find, the thing I find really interesting when we're having these discussions about technology, this is another one of those sort of technology to infrastructure questions, is that, you know, we, a lot of times we perceive things like AI or the network services as these huge existential threats that are kind of externalities coming at us that we have to deal with. But if we live in cities, we are already, you know, living on this precarious stack of technology that we've managed to integrate into our everyday life. I mean, no one knows where their food comes from, where their water comes from, you know, like, it's, it's, it's all... We're inside this, you know, this ecosystem that's been built out of, you know, you know, eons of human activity that have like brought us to this point. And so, like, there's a moment where we start where some of these things pass into the everyday. And so, I'm sort of wondering, where, you know, what you guys imagine are some of the first sort of machine learning or sort of augmented, you know, intelligent system services that we're going to start to see as the, the, you know, sort of signs of everyday life. I'd like to tell you a little story, and um, by the way, I think the way to get the general public to understand the real deep uh, implications of this technology is through narrative, because pe most people's brains don't think in a purely analytical way, they think in terms of narrative. So um, TV shows like Black Mirror, which show you, for example, what are the implications of this little device that mm. everyone is holding in their mm. hand and staring at constantly. Um, if those shows are produced in a technically sound way, they can give people a good insight into the future. Unfortunately, most entertainment is not mm. technically sound. It's giving us perhaps uh, misleading pictures of what the future will look like. Um, the story I wanted to tell you is about a colleague of mine, a, a physicist who's actually at the MIT, who's at the MIT Media Lab, who travels a lot, and his wife is an artist who stays at home. And she's gradually become somewhat emotionally attached to her echo. It started out as just a thing in her kitchen that she would say, oh, play me some music from the 80s or something like mm -hmm. this. But then he's told me that she gradually gets emotional support talking to the Echo while mm -hmm. he's traveling. <laughs> and I think that, okay, maybe that's a slightly unusual story given how crappy <laughs> the Echo is today. <laughs> but uh, in five years, I think, uh, we, if, if people here are familiar with something called GPT-2, uh, in five years, we'll have things which can uh, really have much more emotionally uh, emotionally uh, resonant yeah. conversations with people and tell little stories and things like this. And yes, I think it will. those kinds of alien intelligences will start creeping into our everyday mm -hmm. lives. Sort of take, I mean, interestingly, I think we've had the ability to project anthropomorphization on exactly. technology for a long we, we, time. I mean, the it's, original it's in, Macintosh yeah. was like famously everyone had, you know, they would hug it sometimes when yes. they came home because it was like, it was the first that arrived in their consciousness as a friend. But um, yeah. did, what was your... The, the whole idea of narrative, um, and maybe to bring a more positive tone to it, is these anxieties arising, whether it's uh, technology as a catalyst or also as a determinant of it, where stories of resilience and what you started hinting at um, with cities brings us back to how people try to re, um, reimagine or reform the idea of collectives, right? So collectives from a very same like, individual unit towards governance and all of that. We will find that yet stories of resilience or stories of collectives that the world has not been used to seeing that have existed out there. Everything from parts of the world that have been left behind with all technological waves, where people have, we've seen this in Latin America and parts of Africa and elsewhere, where even the whole idea of connecting to the internet is a community endeavor. Everything from the wire that connects the wire that creates the mask with community-owned networks. These are stories of resilience that are emerging, have always existed, by the way. These are people who have always known that the whole idea of self is centered in the fact that as a collective we exist, therefore I am. In Africa we call it Ubuntu, maybe, you, maybe, maybe you've heard of that. Now, 
we're seeing that also coming in how people are creating resilient technology that is actually applicable to their contexts, but it's not what the world is currently suited to seeing in terms of the models through which we're going to devise, develop, and govern technologies. Mm -hmm. So the stories of resilience do already exist. The stories of building collectively, building for what is sustainable for us, it doesn't necessarily mean it works right next door across the river, across the ocean, or whatever, but it works for us. So the question becomes, can we also think about the technology we're building around society to work for those particular actors, if we center people right now when we talk about them as the experts of their lived experiences and work with them to figure out how does whatever technology we have present it as a humble solution or proposition and work with them to, you know, to build that into what their urgencies, their hopes, their frustrations are, maybe that will start getting us to a point where we're not having um, dichotomous conversations or siloed ones because we cannot con continue in a world that's going to have more and more technological advances to sideline what's happening in the social and political realm and say, oh no, the civil society folks will handle it. Oh no, the world will cost correct. Oh no, more technology is going to solve that. No, and if until we radically change, and I think this we're really living through a very narrow moment where we can either think about that or completely miss it altogether and we can enter what this so-called arms race everybody is talking about. Um, and I'll end with another narrative. You know, somebody talked about an arms race going on and I'm like we could learn from the marathoners who are always in it for the long haul to do that for the long haul for governments to do that for the long haul how about just thinking a bit different and thinking of the people we've not typically been seeing when we talk about um, all these things and work with them to figure out how we can build better models we might yet emerge out of this uh, in a good tone definitely <laughs> do you have I mean, I have a couple of other questions but I don't know if you have a response to well, that you want to get in since I uh, she mentioned uh, policy and regulation. Mm -hmm. Since I have in front of me uh, some Europeans who set some standards which are wasting huge amounts of human time now, I would just like to say that um, I now cannot surf the web without having to click I accept millions of times, <laughs> wasting not just my time, but your time and your time. Every, lots of human attention is being wasted clicking uh, an I accept of a policy that no one reads so what is actually the benefit of that other than time wastage for humans? So I think it's policy gone berserk. Okay? Wow. No one reads okay. the policies. Well, I no one I, reads the policies. I think I'm going to step out of my role as a moderator and respond to that <laughs> because that's an egregious <laughs> statement. Yeah, no, I would say that uh, the, the policy that no one really reads is called a EULA. And we're, it's something that's offered to you by corporations that have actually managed to take your data and work with it. We're in happy a very to way. have the EULA. Why yeah. do I have to click I accept? Because, well, because I'm not reading. EULA... I'm not reading it. We just let's face reality, okay? People are not reading the EULA. They Post the are. EULA somewhere so that if you want to see it, you can. But why do you want to take two seconds of my life to force me to hunt on the page and click I accept? It's, it's just silly. It's just policy run amok. Uh, Stephen, it goes back to something you talked about earlier and explainability, and I'm just looking down the clock and I'm like, it's just gotten interesting. But with explainability here, there is a desire, and I think the law here has made it sure that there's that, that desire to understand what I am agreeing to is something that is actually a process to go through. Now, there are too many people interested in that I agree button that have not allowed us room to redesign the whole idea around consent. But there's a desire there, a convergence on explainability. People want to know what it is I'm agreeing to. Um, companies want to make sure they're adhering to the rules that the, go the governments have had to put in place to say that we need to know. The problem is converging around how we're going to make this explainability something that we, one, understand what we're agreeing to, to design in a way that you're not wasting that time, convenience is still important. But that's only going to happen if we actually can come to the table and everyone is not trying to be the most excellent victim and figure out these are all actually interests that have to be co-governed <laughs> to, co to make sure that we have a better way to say, yes, I have agreed to this. I understand what I have agreed to, uh, and I don't have to waste the time. J just to clarify, I'm not against forcing companies to have EULAs. I'm right. against wasting user time to click a little button. Which I think is and a so, design And issue, so yeah. one should be very, very careful when imposing policy. There are unintended consequences of policies. No human is smart enough to actually look forward and say, oh yes, I will now, or my committee, will now implement this policy and this is the actual consequence five years from now that will result from that policy. It doesn't really actually work that way. Mm -hmm. So I think some level of, uh, shall we say, uh, caution before just pushing out regulations and policies. So as an American, that's what it looks, that's what this continent <laughs> looks like to us. Uh, I, I thought I, I was gonna say that you sounded like perhaps you were 
starring in your own episode of Black Mirror, <laughs> being the, well, being the yes. leader of a genomics laboratory who's like uh, wanting to get Wait. rid of regulation seemed like it was, uh, I, I, look, there was a lot of, there are a lot not, of features not, that we're wandering I'm, into here. I'm not against regulation. I think regulation is important. <laughs> no, to, no, that's what I'm saying. Right. I think you. But, but I think, but I think we should be cautious no, about certainly. pushing things out because they are going to have consequences which are often not understood by the designers when they uh, no, fair push enough. them out. Uh, there's definitely a, a sort of a, a cruising altitude that sort of needs to be reached. And I think that's part of, you know, part of where we're at right now is sort of understanding, you know, there is this huge stack that we're on, including the technologies that we've already considered infrastructure like the city, and now some of these new technologies that are, you know, happening in the network services and the ones that are coming up like AI and genomics, where we need to figure out where, where is the line, you know, in which sort of the, the public, public sector and the private sector find this interface. And this is a very, this in and of itself is also a very complex interface of where these interplays between the, the roles of these agencies are. And so I think, you know, this, this convocation here, as you were saying before, it's these types of conversations that provide us with the abilities to try and work out where those, where those lines are drawn back and forth. And which, I mean, the most humbling and perhaps frustrating thing, and especially for technologists to realize, is that we cannot outsource trust to technologies. We can try, and we really are trying, but at the core of all this, again, the anxieties we're feeling, the pulse of society today, is that we do not want to, ex to exist in a world where we're being told we outsource that. It still goes back to people. Behind the principles of a company holds, there are people who are supposed to enforce it. How do we ensure that the systems we're building, and especially through instruments of governance and policy, are, are, are people-centric first and not technology-centric? And that's the, gr that's the great conundrum in uh, local, regional, and global governance conundrums everywhere. Definitely. Well, thank you both so much. Thank that you. was really, really great. <laughs> thank you.